Okay, hi to everyone again. Uh, so we continue our Thursday session. Now with us, we have uh, Matt Kerr from Washington University in San Luis. He's an expert in, in many topics in algebraic geometry, and one of them being a Hodge theory, and he's going to let us know about variation of positive structure. He's actually, uh, he wrote some of the papers that Thomas and collaborators has used to learn a lot about, about the Swamland program. And he moreover has been working with physics. So I think uh, he's a perfect person to uh, let us know about this topic. So please, Matt, let me just do this. Thank you. I really appreciate the invitation and that the organizers have put this event together just as the COVID restrictions lift and we can actually have mathematical and physical vitality again. Um, I am going to give three lectures here. The first is about variations of hot structure, just to talk about the language. And I will try to match Thomas's notation as much as I can. For instance, my base was S. It will now become M, if I remember. <laughs> Holler at me if I don't. Um, and the, the next two lectures will be about asymptotics. Um, Variations, so sort of degenerations on a punctured disk, on a punctured, on a product of two punctured disks. But first, I have to introduce the language, and before I do that, let me say a little bit about motivation. So the main idea of Hodge theory, which I'll abbreviate HT, is to convert families of complex algebraic varieties. To uh, in algebraic geometry, we would say local systems and differential equations. Local systems are basically the monodromy representations that tell you how the periods are not multi valued and the differential equations govern the periods. And the periods are just the M of V charges that Thomas was telling us about. Um, the, the gadget that does this is something called, it converts the varieties into local systems and differential equations. We call it period map, when, which as an algebraic geometer, when you first encounter it, if you are not very analytically minded, is a weird thing because you're starting in the algebraic world and then you're, you're putting the analytic topology on these things and doing integrals and over, over sort of topological objects. So you're looking at the analytic and topological invariants of algebraic varieties. Why should we do this? Well, I mean, I suppose the first bit of motivation for that really historically comes from the Hutch conjecture and also maybe before that, the work of Leschetz and Poincaré. Um, and it, you know, Leschetz, as he said, his lot in life was to insert the harpoon of algebraic topology into the body of the whale of algebraic geometry, which is a very convoluted way of expressing this, the slight weirdness of the situation. So the point of these three talks and tomorrow is going to be to concentrate on asymptotic Hodge theory. And you can, you can analyze all kinds of behavior for these local systems and differential equations. You can look at the differential behavior. I'll talk a little bit about this today when I talk, discuss transversality, because that does produce important constraints on the asymptotics of the boundary. Arithmetic behavior, which I won't really discuss very much in these talks. I'll just make a note about it at one point. But a lot of my recent work has been in this direction. And then the asymptotic. These are sort of the main uh, routes on pursuits. And the asymptotic stuff, um, the, the point of view I'll take is I want to understand it in the context of geometric degenerations, because that's what's of most use to physicists. And um, the relationship of um, the asymptotic the asymptotic object is not the degenerate object. Asymptotic limiting objects, which are called limiting mixed Hodge structures to the geometry 
of the singular fiber, because as we saw in these swamp land conjectures, one wants to connect um, sort of degenerating, especially shrinking to a point, um, Lagrangian three cycles on your Colonia threefold to asymptotics of their periods, which is what this is. So we want to connect these two things. And then there are two sort of, I understand that exact sequences are a little bit scary for physicists, but there are two exact sequences that connect the asymptotic stuff to the stuff at the singular fiber. And this is really key, I think, um, for what aspect of what you want to do in the swamp land conjectures. Uh, they, one of them is famously known as the Clement Schmidt exact sequence. And then also the structure of degenerations, um, I mean, of Hodge structure in several variables. <laughs> The L is done for in elementary. Limited. So it's asymptotic. I mean, so why does one study the asymptotic stuff in algebraic geometry? So you want to understand compactifications of specific period maps relating what we call the Hodge theoretic boundary, which is given in terms of these limiting uh, mixed Hodge structures, to um, the algebraic. Algebra geometric boundary of moduli spaces. Typically, there are two standard ways of do, doing those compactifications. One is by something called geometric invariant theory, and the other is in terms of the minimal model program that sometimes goes by the name of KSDA compactifications. Um, and then there are also in studies asymptotic Hodge theory applications to algebraic cycles, monodromy of complex varieties, and a whole host of other things. But in physics, um, you know, so far, this has already had many applications. Um, there are applications of asymptotic Hodge theory to local mirror symmetry, to Feynman integrals, actually allows you to compute Feynman integrals. Um, topological string theory, so there are some connections to the spectra of quantum curves. Um, and finally, the swap time conjectures, at least we hope. So let me begin by defining what is a Hodge structure. And like Thomas, I will need to use some abbreviations. So there are three equivalent definitions of the Hodge structure on V, which is going to be a finite dimensional Q vector space. And I will take its dimension to be R, R for rank. So Hodge structure of weight N on V. I suppose later this will be D in Thomas's notation. This capital D. So first is by a decreasing filtration. This is slightly fancier. Than, um, definition on the complexification of this vector space. So we need the condition on this decreasing filtration that VC can be expressed as the direct sum of FP and FN minus P plus one bar, complex power. The more down to earth one that everyone knows is a decomposition VC into sum over P plus Q equals N of VPQ. Um, and you should think of the relationship between these two things in one of two ways. So the standard way is to say Fj is equal to the direct sum over P greater than or equal to J of Vp and minus P. So it's just the first index has to be bigger than or equal to J. Um, the other way is that you can say that with this definition of F, VPQ itself is equal to FP intersect F n minus P bar. So that gives you uh, the other equivalence. And then finally, in some ways, the most useful definition is in terms of a co character. I call it a co character. Um, 
algebraic group theorists might not be happy with that, but it's a map from the unit circle in the complex plane to SLV. And it's defined over R. So I think of this as the real group U of one. And so elements of this are the form Z equals E to the I theta. And it's a homomorphism. That's what I mean by saying it's a co-character. And it has to send, I place only the constraint that it sends minus one to minus one uh, to the N and the identity on E. Um, and then the equivalence between this and um, the other definitions is that we are going to, given this co-character, um, or rather, let's let's do this equivalence. So we say that the co-character phi on Z restricted to VPQ is going to be the operator Z to the P minus Q times the identity. Get screwing up the recording. All no, 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 no. I right. move around too much. Okay, so the key example I won't say more about at the moment is X is compact Taylor. One question does, yeah. does, the, does the cool guy have less information or exactly the same information? Exactly the same information. Uh, but how do you retrieve? How do you retrieve N? Because I'm, I, it's part of the depth. It's part uh, of the uh, no, I mean, like, uh, okay, so basically, like, as long as P minus Q is same, uh, mm -hmm. P, P, P minus Q is fixed. Okay, the co-character. I mean, the co-character co co gives me projections onto pieces with. Ah, okay, okay, no, it's, it's fine. It's fine yeah. Because P plus Q is okay. Yeah. okay. Z Z varies. Z varies. Okay, so by etc. here, I just mean you look at the PQ form, the closed PQ forms, and those are going to span your VPQ. Okay. Cohomology and complex coefficients, and then HPQ inside here is generated by the closed PQ forms, and that gives you the decomposition. Okay, any questions on that? And phi is what you wrote there? Uh, yeah, right, exactly. Phi, phi is always obtained in this way from the decomposition, and you can, you can recover the decomposition by looking at the chopping up of V into phi of Z eigenspaces for a generic sample. All right. So, in algebraic geometry, uh, when we're talking about hot structures, we usually mean polarized hot structures. So, what is the polarization? Okay. As you saw, any compact Kähler manifold gives a hot structure, but we want polarized hot structures. In general, compact Kähler manifolds don't give polarized hot structures. So, a polarization is a bilinear form, Q, defined over the rationals. And we assume that if n is odd, then it's anti-symmetric, and if n is even, it's symmetric. So minus one to the m symmetric and non-degenerate. And it has to satisfy two Hadriemann bilinear relations. What are these? Okay. The first intuitively says that if you wedge too many DZs or too many DZ bars together, you get zero, okay? Um, you've got to wedge the right number together. So if I take the polarization and I apply it to VPQ, so a vector in VPQ and a vector in say P prime and Q prime, then this is zero unless P plus P prime and Q plus Q prime both add up to N, okay? This can be stated very elegantly in terms of the co-character, as saying that phi of S1 uh, gives a subgroup of the real Lie group, GR equals dot GR preserving Q, and I take the connected component of the identity. Okay. The second bilinear relation, sort of um, like if you if you wedge together, um, let's say dz and dz bar on an elliptic curve viewed as c modulo a lattice, right? You know, you, you get, what is it? 2i times dx wedge dy. The dx wedge dy has positive volume. And so this is a generalization of that. We want i to the p minus q times q 
applied to V and V bar greater than zero for all V in V P Q is on zero. Okay. So this is a statement about some correction of the polarization by something called the V operator being positive definite. Okay, that's one way to think of this. And it can also be stated in terms of phi. It has the immediate consequence. Um, Deline points this out that if U in V is a sub hot structure of a polarized hot structure, then there is an orthogonal complement. And that's sort of making use of this correction, uh, this positive definite that I referred to. Uh, so you have a decomposition of V as hot structures. So the category of polarized Hodge structures over Q is semi-simple. The standard example here is that if X is smooth projective, not just Taylor, so algebraic, like Gaga, of dimension B, and H a hyperplane section, cut X by a hyperplane um, and take its class in cohomology, then you have isomorphisms from Hn of X for any N to H to D minus N of X by coupling with the hyperplane class D minus N times. Okay. And then you define the N primitive cohomology of X with Q coefficients to be the kernel of the cup product with one more copy, um, D minus N plus one. This is then polarized by Q of alpha beta is minus one to the N choose two of the integral over X of alpha cup beta cup D minus N copies of the hyperplane class, okay? And for a more concrete example, we can consider an elliptic curve, that's one for us, given by C modulo the lattice generated by one and some tau in the upper half plane. Um, or maybe we could take tau in the lower half plane, well, as we'll see, we don't want to do that. That the normalizations I'll choose. If I take V to be the first cohomology of this elliptic curve, then that's generated by the, the duals of two cycles. Um, I should probably erase something and draw a picture. So let me erase. Elliptic curve and two cycles beta and alpha. And these are their duals, which lie in the first cohomology. And then I would take V1, comma zero to be the fan of DZ in complex cohomology which I can write as a class as alpha dual plus tau beta dual because dz has periods one and tau over alpha and beta. And then you say that since Q of alpha dual beta dual is one because there's one intersection point and that's giving you the intersection, you deduce that squared and minus one Q dz bz bar is greater than zero if and only if tau is in the upper half plane. Okay. And so that gives you um, the equivalence of polarization or polarized hot structure to tau being in the upper half. And of course, you could just change the sign of Q and make it tau be the lower half. Any questions on that? All right. Well, next.
Any second, what was the condition of the first what's Freeman relationship in terms of this phi map to its NPR? It was taking values in one? Uh, it was taking the image of the circle homomorphism to be in the uh, the, the group of either symplectic or orthogonal transformations with respect to <clears throat> Okay. So sorry. So in, in the elliptic curve example, yeah, it's condition. So it looks like um, using the color form it goes into S L two R. Five S one goes into S L two R. So this is S five S five Z goes into S L two R. This is well, I mean, it's the same thing down here. So this is always an algebraic condition on the image of five. This is always a real analytic. So uh, in it's obviously an inequality. But you can think of this um, in what I'm about to write as cutting out a, an algebraic subvariety of a product of Grassmannians given by possible flags in BC. And this as cutting out a real analytic open subset of that projective. So period domains are classifying spaces for hot structures. We have the pick fix of V. And you fix a Q, um, non-degenerate, symmetric or anti-symmetric form. Uh, and you have to fix Hodge numbers. So what are these? This is a list of HPQs, P plus Q equals N. And for now, I insist that P and Q be not negative, um, such that there's sum is equal to R. And then um, if we fix a polarized Hodge structure, it's one phi, that's a co character or equivalently a polarized odd structure um, with my this equivalence. Gem B from Q equals HPQ. Phi has those hot numbers. Then we declare that the domain for all such hot structures is going to be. The orbit by GR. GR, remember, was automorphisms of VR preserving Q acting on phi by conjugation. So this is action by conjugation um, or by translation, by left translation. On the corresponding Hodge flag, which I'll write. Okay. This is a connected component. If n is odd, if n is uh, even, or it's equal if n is odd, in what I'll just call dh tilde. I won't really care about the difference between these very much. I'm just writing this for clarity. So dh tilde is is indeed the set of all decompositions. E into VPQs, C VPQs of dimension equal to HPQ, on which Q satisfies both Hodge Riemann bilinear relations. And then this, as I was saying, is an analytic open inside DH check. This is called the compact dual. This is the period domain. This is a connected component, usually equal to the whole thing. Well, always equal to the whole thing if n is odd, which is what we care about. Um, and this is an analytic open inside this compact dual, which is what you get when you take GC, automorphism of VC preserving Q, and apply it to the Hodge flag. This orbit will not consist entirely of Hodge structures. What does it consist of? It's flags f dot of VC 
with dimensions of graded pieces, they have P, uh, H equal to H, P, and minus P, satisfying Hadriman 1, Q, which can be written in the form Q of F, P, F, N minus P plus 1 equals 0. Okay. For all the and then the key example here is very simple to write down. It's just um, H equals H in P1. objects here, upper half plane. So this is the compact dual. This is the period domain for elliptic curves, right? For Calabia three folds, you know, we're talking then about, again, these two objects are the same. Um, typically you have Hodge numbers, one AA1, and that will be contained inside some compact dual. So that's just what it looks like. But these are already quite big. If A is just one, then this is four dimensional over C, these objects. Nasty. Okay. Any questions about that part? But what is the, this group acting on the lower? So GC was automorphisms of GC preserving. Again, if, if N is odd, this is a symplectic group. If N is even, it's a it's an orthogonal group. More or less all one has to say over C. Over R, it's a little bit more rich. You you have to differentiate the various kinds of possible orthogonal groups, right? Because they're going to be indefinite orthogonal groups. So, uh, you know, those aren't all the same. But anyway, I don't want to get into the kind of details. Right for K3? Uh, for K3? Yeah. Okay. For K3, uh, right. For K3, this will be what's called a type four symmetric. This will be a type four symmetric domain. Okay. So if you look, if if you want all algebraic K3s, it's going to be a 19-dimensional type four symmetric domain. So this G, this GR, um, since we're only operating on uh, we're only operating on primitive cohomology, uh, it would be SO219. And the compact uh... the compact dual, I mean. It would have SOC21. So again, it would, I mean, it's some type four compact dual. It's some, it's some projective homogeneous just right. I mean, these are, these are difficult. I mean, to get one's hands on explicitly, but at this level, you don't need to see that. But they are just quotients of groups, right? Yeah, they're of the form GC mod. So I should say, you can rewrite this as GC mod parabolic. You can rewrite this as GR modulo a compact sum, but not maximal. So this should be a very familiar in physics that if the moduli space of the K3 is just SO something. SO219 divided, divided by a compact sum, divided by <laughs> SO2 so cross SO19. And for Calabria four, uh, three folds, you can do the same thing. And for Calabria that's four, right. that's right. So they're not groups. They're groups. They are three folds too. So Calabria three folds. If if the uh, if say A is one, then it's SP four modulo uh, U of one cross U of one. So this is not the moduli space. This is the this is the period domain. It's the period domain. Yeah, about to do moduli space. So. All right, so any weight and variation of Hodge structure, um, sorry, not any, A, weight and variation of Hodge structure over a complex manifold M is given by what? Two pieces of data, a local system, 
main thing is a monodromic representation, P over M, with U and P cross B to the constant uh, local system over S over M. Um, again, non degenerate, minus one to the X metric. So this is the same thing or gives rise to a global monodromy representation uh, rho I one of them to GQ. And we call the image M. It's the monodromy group. The second piece of information is a decreasing <laughs> filtration or flag on, I take the local system and I tensor it with holomorphic functions on M. You can think of this as, uh, if you like sheaves, as the sheaf of sections of the vector bundle corresponding to the local system. If you don't like <laughs> like that, just think of it as the vector bundle, um, whose fibers are going to be the polarized hot structures over each point. That's how was talking about. So we have a filtration by holomorphic subbundles. Such that restricting to fibers, Yields polarized hot structures. And then we have a connection, nabla, from V to omega 1s, tensor V. It's a fancy way of saying that I know how to differentiate sections of this vector. Um, and the, sec the connection is defined uniquely by saying that on the complexification of the local system, it's zero. Um, it also has to satisfy, this is a restriction on the filtration by holomorphic subbundles that novel applied to FP puts you inside FP minus one, the next, uh, step in the flag. I'm questioning the wisdom of switching from S to M. <laughs> I wanted to emphasize the connection with uh, Thomas was talking. So this is called either the IPR or Griffith's transversality. I, I like infinitesimal period relation, which is what Griffiths himself actually calls it, um, because the shortage right on the board. Example, if X over M is a holomorphic family of smooth projective varieties, let me just say it's projective fibers, then I'm gonna write the following. Say I want to understand in families um, how sections of the relative differential forms vary, okay? then what I need to do is take section over all of M, or at least an open subset of M. And what I'm gonna write is Z. Z is supposed to mean um, vertically closed, okay? Vertically closed sections. So here I have basically closed relative differential forms over the base. Now I'm going to lift those, I'm gonna lift that section to sections over all of X um, of FP A N X. Okay, I mean, pardon the kind of approximate notation here. Here I really mean if this is pi, I mean like pi lower star. This. The idea is I'm taking a family of relative differential forms and lifting them to actual differential forms on X. And then I apply the exterior derivative on X. And that's going to give me 
vertically closed um, n plus one forms. But now there's a change. Because my forms were vertically closed, that means they developed a horizontal foot when I differentiated them, right? I can't go, I can't acquire more degree vertically. So I have to acquire some degree horizontally. And that means that I'm in the first Lorray filtrant of these differential forms. And so now what I can do is I can take the image of this in Z of the base coefficients in omega one M tensor F P minus one uh, informs on the fibers. And what's happened here is I have F P here, but I'm using up one of my F one of my DZs. This tells me I have at least PDZs in my differential forms as opposed to DZ bars. Here I'm splitting off the horizontal bit and I'm using the fact that I have PDZs to say that this horizontal bit has a piece that has a DZ horizontally and P minus one DZs vertically. So this is saying that when I apply differentiation of the cohomology class along fibers, that I'm going to go from FP HN to FP minus one HN. Okay, that's the idea, roughly speaking. Notation is kind of garbage, but I just wanted to make sure everyone understands why this transversality is true in the case of projective models, smooth projective models. Okay, questions? Does it make sense? Uh, it's something with just complex differential forms. Yeah. Is there an intuitive way to understand this Libre? Uh, because, but because of that. Yeah, it, 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 so what it means is that if you restrict the form to the fiber, like you pull it back to a fiber, yeah. you get zero. Okay, so it has a horizontal foot, as it were. If there's a horizontal component to the differential form, there is a piece that looks like, you know, D of a coordinate on N. And so if you pull it back to the fiber, that vanishes and you get zero. So that means that it's well defined to look at its image in here. That's one question. A here is a smooth differential forms. The yeah, the they're supposed to be smooth C infinity differential forms. And then the X is the other one. Uh, and the, again, I should I should I sh I really need to put my little star here. And the, the X is the the logotic one or the both. So it's delta plus delta bar or just delta? Um I'm doing this and then taking the one zero part. So yeah. It's very, it's not very precise. <clears throat> okay. So how do I get from a variation of hot structure to a period map? Because I haven't told you what a period map is. This is a formalization of the masses that Thomas was talking about. Period map is simply going to be a complex analytic map from M to DH modulo the monodromy group. Okay. One is the, the monodromy group, is, you can think of it as matrices with integer entries. It's acting on the left on DH. And we're going to want this map to be called a period map, to be locally liftable to DH. Holomorphic and horizontal. The horizontal means that the image of the differential of the period map is contained in F negative one and Q. F um, inside. And okay. so sorry, can I ask a very yes. nice question? So is the monodromy group something that you know that you the monodromy group use? is something that you sometimes know and sometimes you don't know? And, and does this, it, it can all be, this help you know for families of elliptic curves, it's easy to calculate. For families of Calabi threefolds, it's extremely difficult to calculate. And you know. But there does all this help or not? Does to, to know what that might sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so there's a 
it helps in many ways. Um, but as I said, it's very difficult to know exactly what it is if you're not in a case where DH is a Hermitian symmetric domain. If DH is a Hermitian symmetric domain, you're cooking with gas and things become much easier. But if DH is something like a Calabi-Yau period domain, it's very difficult. And it's very difficult even to figure out whether gamma is a finite index in GQ, uh, sorry, in GZ for some determination of what integral matrices are, um, or of infinite domains. So that's the arithmetic versus thin dichotomy. And people have spent a lot of, uh, done a lot of work in the last decade or so to figure out among the 14 hypergeometric variations over P1 minus three points of Calabi type with Hodge numbers one, 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 one. Seven of them are thin and seven of them are very arithmetic. And that's extremely difficult here. So, okay, so, so my question was more for all this construction, knowing what gamma is, is important or you just need to know it, I don't know, the local, the local type. So. For some things, it's enough to understand local moments. And um, I think for some of the things that Thomas is talking about, local, local is enough. Mm -hmm. So I will be talking about the local structure later. But Sorry, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Do you have any intuition for why this horizontality condition is a good condition? <laughs> well, I mean, the point is it's observed right. in the wild. Yeah. Whenever you have an actual smooth projected family of varieties, it is something that happens. Um, so the idea is to formalize that by this notion of period maps with this condition. Um, and I'm about to show you why it's crucial and why it, okay. Uh, so the, the, is capital phi supposed to be a relative version of uh, the co-character? No, it's, it. well, you could view this as a family of co-characters, yes, with one for each point in M. That, that's one way you could think of it. Okay, so this thing here is called the horizontal distribution, W. It's a sub-bundle of the tangent bundle of DH, and horizontality exactly says that the image of D phi is contained in this distribution. So this cuts down on the possible dimension of the image of this, unless, of course, DH is, as I said, emission symmetric, um, in which case, unless there are gaps in the Hodge numbers or something, which never happens, in which case, this is all of the tangent bundle. Okay, that's why I said that case is easier. But that case is never true when you're dealing with the kinds of calabi families that come up in this. Okay. So let me give an example now. Um, just a family of elliptic curves degenerating over a punctured disk. This is sort of the crucial example for these talks. Um, one crucial example. And the elliptic curve is degenerating to a nodal elliptic curve. And you have the following sort of picture. Beta degenerating to this cycle here. And alpha degenerating to this point. And this is all taking place over the function disk. Whether or not I include this fiber depends on what I want to do. I'm, I'm omitting it to get the variation of hot structure for the period, but when I want to compactify the period, and the monogramy operator is associated to going once counterclockwise about the function. And what happens when you do that is that this, this cycle ends up getting twisted by alpha. the Dane twist. So degenerating to nodal rational curve, V is locally generated by the duals of alpha and beta. Okay, this is supposed to be H1 of the fibers uh, with Q coefficients. And monodromy sends um, alpha dual to alpha dual minus beta dual. When you dualize, this is what happens. The beta dual goes to itself. Okay. I will be denoting the monodromy operator by T later on. And then F1S, the family of 
sub bundles, which is going to be a line bundle, is just generated by the class of a holomorphic, a relative holomorphic one form. And we can write omega s in the following way f of s alpha dual plus g of s plus f of s l of s. L of s here is log of s over 2 pi i. Okay, so you see what happens is alpha, as you go once around, gets corrected by minus beta, but then L of s gets corrected by plus 1. And so that cancels out the correction over here. And so this is actually a single valued family of objects. Okay. It goes to something that looks like d log of, of z on the coordinate of this known rational curve uh, in the limit. And these two functions here are holomorphic functions of s on the entire disk. And then you can just say that. In this setting, nabla ds, differentiation along the connection in direction ds, it just differentiates, period. So it's just computing f prime of s alpha dual plus, if I call this whole thing g of s, g prime of s beta dual. And that, the fact that that is no longer in f1 is computing you the differential of the period now. Okay? So when did I start? Uh, I, mean, yeah. I think I'm going to go a little over. Yeah. So yeah. up to 22, one. 22, one. OK. I'll try to do that. Um, I'll go a little faster. Yeah. OK, so because global monodromy is very hard to compute, I'm going to talk about Local monotropy. So, the talks. Um, let me just note here that if T inverse is the action of monodromy on a basis of V by following, by parallel translating on the local system as I go around the function. Um, and that's kind of the opposite of the monodromy action I want, because what I really want to do is I want to um, look at these so-called single-valued objects, write them with respect to this multi-valued basis, and consider that multi-valued basis as constant. So that makes the single-valued objects look not constant. This is what one actually does in object theory. One fixes the vector space V and then looks at how the formula uh, for omega s uh, with respect to these objects gets changed if you think of them as staying constant. So as you see, what will happen is this will actually have an f of s added to it. So then p is going to be the monodromy, uh, represents the monodromy action on a single valued object. Object written with respect to uh, this basis, multiplied basis. Um, so that's why it, they're inverse operators. Okay. Now the key statement is the monitor. And it holds at the level of an abstract variation of Hodge structure. Given a variation of pod structure over the function disk, P e is quasi universal. In other words, there is some power M such that if I raise T to that power, subtract off the identity, and then take the result to a sufficiently high power, I get zero. Um, A little bit more precisely, you can say that M never has to be bigger than the weight of the Hodge structure, and um, capital M uh, never has to be such that its Euler phi function is less than or equal to R. So those are bounds on how big, big M can be. And um, 
So, so I can I ask about this? Yeah. So, so, so M, so there are upper bounds on the very, on the capital M. Mm -hmm. It comes from the fact that, yeah, this is what is this saying? This is saying that T has a Jordan decomposition into semi-simple and unipotent parts. What this is, the content of this theorem is really that this is a finite order, meaning that its eigenvalues are roots of unity. And so, voila, in order for this T semi-simple to be defined over Q on a rank R vector space, this is an upper bound on what? on what the roots of unity, what the orders of the roots of unity can be in order for their Galois conjugates, you know, to give you something to break. It's just like a lot. So, so just to make it easier, I think phi is the uh, base of the same thing? You know, so uh, this is phi is the Euler phi. Is that another phi? Okay. Euler, Euler, Euler. Oh, Euler, that's Euler, not Euler, the Euler, 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 Euler phi function. Oh, OK. Uh, what are the assumptions of this theorem? Like, um, do we take an completely abstract VHS or is it a VHS coming from completely abstract? And this is where um, this horizontality transversality thing is crucial. Let me just very quickly summarize how you prove this. Um, the point is that you have this punctured disk going into some period domain D, right? This has the Poincaré metric. This has the Hodge metric. But the image of this is constrained to lie inside an integral manifold of the horizontal distribution. Okay, the Hodge metric in these directions has negative holomorphic sectional curvature bounded away from zero, and the effect of that is that these maps are always distance decreasing. Okay, now if you buy that, the proof is uh, basically the following: you say phi, um, replace this with the upper half plane, replace this, this was d by gamma, replace this by d, and call this thing phi tilde. Phi tilde of um, i k, we can write as g k times h, where d is d r modulo h. Okay. So these are cosets of H. And then I simply say that the distance inside D between GKH and T GKH, well, this is bounded by the distance in the upper half plane between, um, say, X plus IK and IK plus one. But that's one over k by the corner of the metric. And so now the point is this is the distance in, in D. Sorry, I've changed the notation. The distance in D between H and GK inverse T GKH. Right? And so what this tells you is that GK inverse T GK limits to being in this compact H, this is compact. Right. Conjugation doesn't change the eigenvalues of T. So this is saying in the end, the eigenvalues of T have to be eigenvalues of something in a compact group. That means they have to be on the unit circle. But now T is an integral matrix at the end of the day. Kronecker's theorem says that if you have an algebraic integer, which is what you're going to get when you take roots of the characteristic polynomial of this T. You have an algebraic integer, all of whose Galois conjugates are roots are on the unit circle, and it's a root of unit. Okay. Uh, eigenvalues of T are, let's just say, the spectrum of T uh, consists of roots. That's four L's. It's just hyperbolic complex analysis. That's it. Nothing about families of variables. It's a little weird that Borel gave that proof, and Landon and Griffiths gave the algebraic variety proof, the proof where you assume it's coming from geometry. Because, like, you think of Borel as being more algebraic than those people, but he gave this completely general proof. 
<clears throat> okay, so, sorry again, just to gain some intuition. So these two yeah. metrics in your setup, Thomas, one of them is more as this metric. I'm using the Hodge metric, the one yes. he doesn't like. And the other one? Uh, his is this Bay Peterson metric, which I know nothing about. <laughs> Well, okay. uh, what's his edge? Uh, what's his compact set edge? This compact is is this is the subgroup. Uh, the subgroup that is the isotropy group of phi. Okay. Remember that D was the gr orbit of phi. Okay. I really should have written this one clearly. Okay. Right. So the orbit of phi can be written naturally as a quotient of G by the isotropic group, the thing that doesn't, that fixes phi. Okay. And it's compact. I'm just, I'm not going to prove that. Um, another immediate consequence, by the way, of the curvature properties of period domains is that any variation of Hodge structure over P1 minus two points or over an elliptic curve is just isotropic. It has finite monodromy and the, the flag doesn't vary at all. It's not interesting. You have to remove at least three points from P1 or one point from an elliptic curve or work over an entire genus uh, curve or variations over a curve to get something non okay? All right, let me just give a first view at uh, asymptotics. And then maybe- So as part of the definition of a hot structure, you have considered Q vector spaces, right? And that's right. So if you consider like C vector spaces, then will this still be true or? Uh, it gets, yeah, when, when, yeah, it wouldn't be true because I'm, I'm applying Kronecker's there, for which I need to know the monodromy is essentially there. Okay, so let me give a first look at asymptotics, and then I think I probably have to not say, and the rest is not really essential. I'm not going to say anything about the Hodge numbers, so. This is, this part is crucial. Um, Say I have a variation of Hodge structure over the punctured disk. That's the setting I'm going to work in or talk to. Um, I want to associate a limiting object that captures the monodromy and asymptotic behavior as t goes to zero. Uh, and perhaps also something about the singular factor. So this is just going to be a long example. Let's go one step beyond elliptic curves and take the variation of Hodge structure to be given by H1 of a family of genus two curves. So the picture looks like this and will be degenerating to something like this. So these are two nodes and then I have my cycles, which I wanna call beta one, Beta two, so we'll generate this like this, and then I have the end of cycles uh, alpha one and alpha two that I'm pinching to points. So I give myself two holomorphic one forms on each CT, so varying holomorphically with normalized so that the integral of omega j over alpha i is the chronic of delta. Then I also um, am assuming this degeneration is done in such a way that t applied to beta i gives beta i plus alpha. And I guess according to the notation over there, I really need t. So that's going to give me that the integral of omega i over beta i looks like something holomorphic plus log over two pi i. So the parameter on this disk is t. So that gives me that the, I mean, the, this Hodge flag is just F0 and F1. F0 is everything. F1 is the holomorphic, uh, is this, this stuff. F1T is F1H1CT is the column space where I'm writing things with respect to alpha one, alpha two, beta one, and beta two dual of one, zero, zero, one. That's from this Kronecker delta relation. And then using this thing here, 
H1 plus L of T, H3, H3, H2 plus L of T. Okay, so this is what you get. That means if I take the limit as T goes to zero of F1 of T, what do I get? I get the column space of zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one. Because what happens is these L of T's go off to infinity. And so by comparison, all this holomorphic stuff might as well be zero, thinking projectively. Okay, that's boring. That tells me no information at all. How do I fix it? In fact, it's especially appalling in light of the fact that what is this C0? C0 is isomorphic to P1, where I've attached, say, 0 to infinity, and I've also attached some A to B. That has information in it. There's a cross ratio of those four points that actually matters and means something geometrically. Well, maybe taking H1 of C0 gives me the answer to my question, how to capture this information? Well, it doesn't, because in Hodge theory, this would just be two copies of what's called the trivial Hodge structure of weight zero. It doesn't tell us anything. Along to save the day comes the following trick. Um, so we say, we put N equals T minus the four by four identity. Okay, so T like what? Zero, 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 two by two identity. That's what we get. N. And we can look at this original F1 of T here, twisted by E to the minus L of T N. So that's going to be the column space of. This thing is I2, 0, I2 minus L of T, I2. And then I2, H1 plus L of T, H3, H3, H2 plus L of T. Okay. That is the column space of the following much nicer matrix. And now I can take the limit as t goes to zero, which is just gotten by plugging in zero to these holomorphic functions. And now you analyze what is h3 of zero. Why? It's the integral of omega one zero over beta two. Omega one zero is going to be the differential form that has a residue at this point where I'm attaching zero to infinity. And so it's going to look like dz over z. Beta two, on the other hand, beta two is the thing attaching, uh, it, it's a path from A to B. And so this is just going to give me, let's say one, this is going to be L of B over A which is log of the cross ratio of our four points over two pi i. And so this actually captures limiting geometry. Or even the cohomology of the singular fiber could not. So this is something really interesting. And um, this limiting period matrix, I just want to say this column space, which is sort of a, a point in a Grassmannian, it lives in something called a Hodge theoretic boundary component. Um, and the object that it expresses is something called the limiting mixed Hodge structure, which is what I'm going to talk about in lecture two. Uh, I'm, that's yeah, a good question. It's 20 up. So I'll stop and then take questions. Thank you. So uh, if you take the naive map limit, yes. then uh, Good. 
this is indistinguishable from like uh, two in the generation of the uh, Arabian people. Um, it's indistinguishable. Well, I mean, the point is all the different geometries I would get from attaching different points are indistinguishable from this naive limit point of view. Uh, I wouldn't say it's indistinguishable from a Kalabi Yao simply because the Kalabi Yao naive limit is taking values in a different space. Uh, yeah, but I'm just saying because also the, I mean, the log monogamy, all these, they look like a special case of the Turing degeneration you could get for Kalabi Yao. So Unless, what kind of degeneration did you say? The Turing. Turing degeneration. Yeah, yes, so like, it, uh, absolutely. Yes. Special yes. Of that, but, uh, yes. So I guess it's the, the holomorphic pieces, the H1, 3, the W. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, there are like two uh, two cycles which are shrinking here, mm -hmm. right? Like, and, mm -hmm. So if one cycle shrinks, I guess you get a, uh, I mean, you get a degeneration uh, submanifold co of complex co-dimension one, and you can talk about monodromy. Yes. But if there are two cycles uh, shrinking, then shouldn't this be a, uh, shouldn't this have complex co-dimension two, like a real co-dimension? Uh, yes. Four? That's, How do you make sense of monodromy around the right? That's that's very good. That's a very good question. So I will have to say something next time about uh, limiting mixed hot structures. And one of the things you find when studying limit mixed hot structures is they depend on your choice of local holomorphic coordinate about the equation. How you want this. So the right, the really right setting to consider this degeneration is. Uh, you have a, a three-dimensional moduli space that has a boundary that looks like, like this, okay? So along each boundary component, one of these uh, two nodes appears. So one appears here, one appears here, and then the third, what happens is you get this behavior, a node here appears, okay? And uh, what you find is if you take the limit along here and go modulo the choice of the two local holomorphic coordinates here, you still have the cross ratio information that's preserved. Um, if you go to here, you just get nothing. You get this again, essentially. And that corresponds to the fact that if, at the origin, uh, you will have, uh, well, you'll have some object that looks like two uh, P1s touching at three points and has no information. It's completely rigid. Uh, maybe this is a very silly question, but is it always possible to find a basis on cycle or co-cycle that is fully single valued, like your omega s before? A basis of cycles that is fully, well, so, oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, it is. And that is uh, a, a consequence of the first theorem I will tell you in the next uh, first lecture tomorrow. And uh, yeah, something called the canonical extension. It's the existence of the canonical extension. Okay, oh, thanks. The theorem of Deleuze. <clears throat> so then, very like, where is the information of the metric playing a role here? Metric and the model. I mean, the Thomas talked about the choosing two possible metrics and um, with the three comma zero component or without and. Would that play a well, role or? Uh, the, I, the, as you saw, I used the metric and the fact that the variation is trans, is uh, horizontal, satisfies transversality, mm -hmm. uh, to prove the moment of behavior. Okay. Right? So that's one consequence. Another consequence was the other thing I mentioned about variations over uh, things that don't admit a negative garbage metric. So, that's because you need to pull the Hodge metric needs to pull back to something with negative curvature because it has negative curvature in horizontal directions. Um, if you use the Van Peterson metric, I have no idea what happened. Yeah, it's, 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 it's not true in this yeah. general. <laughs> yeah. so, I, I, so I think it, you need the Hodge metric for, for, for that. Yeah. And, but that just exists. Yeah. So you can just construct it. It doesn't play out. But these two conditions fix the metric completely or? Well, I mean, the way you define the metric is in terms of uh, the killing form on the, the Lie algebra of, the, uh, of G. And then, then orbiting that with uh, basically by conjugation action. Yes, essentially just one good choice, right? Yes, exactly. 
There's one other choice. In fact, yeah, if you want a GR invariant metric, it's basically unique and it's given by the killer, minus the killer. Anyone else? So then, so thanks again. Yeah.